I'm jealous of everybody and everything. I'm jealous of the very words I speak to because they reach your ears and I mustn't go near them. <laughs> How unjust you are. Jealous of the words you speak to me? Why, you know as well as I do that I don't even like them. You, you used to like them. I used to pretend I liked them. It was mere politeness to comparative strangers. I don't believe you know what jealousy is. I don't believe you know how it eats into a man's heart and disorders his digestion and, and turns his interior into boiling lead. You're a heartless jade to trifle with the delicate organization of a human interior. Rest my soul, my agonies I can't control her. Get to sit on the red hot coal and love a heartless jade. The red hot coal will hurt, no doubt, but red hot coal in time dies out. But jealousy you cannot rout, its fires will never fade. It's much less painful on the whole to go and sit on the red hot coal till you're completely flayed. Or ask a kindly friend to crush your wretched bones upon the rest than love a heartless shade, than love a heartless shade. The kerchief on your neck of snow, it goeth for I dare not go. I look on as a deadly foe, it stops there all day long. The belt that holds you in its clasp is to my peace of mind, the rasp its claws, but where I cannot pass, correct me if I'm wrong. It's much less painful on the hall to go and sit on a red hot coal till you're completely fit. Or ask a kindly friend to crack your wretched bones upon the rest, than love a heartless jade, than love a heartless jade. My lip, I put, I had him in my grip. He sifted where I cannot sip, I can't get over that. The cat you fondled, soft and sly, he lieth where I may not lie, when not on terms that can and I. I do not like that cat. <laughs> It's much less painful on the hall to go and sit on the red hot coal till you're completely fit. Or ask a kindly friend to crack your wretched bones upon the rack. Then love a heartless jade, then love a heartless jade. Or ask a kindly friend to crack your wretched bones upon the rack. Then love a heartless
not so faded, but that we with one consent were our love and land invaded, still with face of war and foe, as in days of long ago.
on hope yet. Thy brother, who, as a reward for his valiance in defending his standard and cutting down fifty foes who would have hanged him, has been appointed a yeoman of the guard, shall return today. And as he travels from Windsor, where the court lies, it may be, it may be, that he brings the expected reprieve with him. Oh, men to that, for the colonel twice saved my life, and I would gladly give the rest of mine to save his in return. And you, wilt thou not be glad to see thy brother, with the fame of whose exploits all of England is ringing? Well, my brother Leonard is a brave man indeed, and I love brave men. All brave men? Most of them, I verily believe. But I hope that Leonard will not be too strict with me. They say he's a mere dragon of virtue and circumspection. Now, my father is kindness in itself, and- And Andrew leaves thee pretty well to thine own ways, eh? Well, I have no fear for thee. Thou hast a feather brain, <laughs> but thou art a good lass. That's all very well. But if Leonard is going to tell me that I may not do this, and may not do that, and must not walk with this one, or talk with that one, but go through the world with my eyes cast down and lips pursed up, like some nun who has renounced mankind, why, as I have not renounced mankind, and do not mean to renounce mankind, I won't have it. There. Nay, he shan't check thee any more than is good for thee, Phoebe. <coughs> Thy brother is a brave man, and the bravest amongst brave men. And yet it seems just yesterday he stole from the lieutenant's orchard. Father! Uh, Leonard, my brave boy! Oh, I'm right glad to see thee. And so is Phoebe. <coughs> Hast thou Colonel Fairfax's reprieve? Nay, I have here a dispatch for the lieutenant, but no reprieve for the colonel. Poor gentleman. I, I would I had brought better news. I'd give my right hand, nay, my body, my life to save his. Dost thou speak in earnest, my lad? Ay, father, I'm no braggart. Did he not save thy life? And am I not his foster brother? Then hearken to me. Hast thou come to join the yeomen of the guard? Well. And none have seen thee enter but ourselves. And a sentry who took but scant notice of me. Now to prove thy word, give me the dispatch and get ye hence. Here is some money. I'll send ye more later. Lie low for a space and tell no one. I shall convey a suit of yeoman's uniform to the colonel's cell, and he shall shave his beard so that none may know him. And then I will own him as my own son, the brave Leonard Merrill, who saved his flag and cut down fifty men who thirsted for his life. My brother Yeoman shall warrant, shall welcome him, I'll warrant that. But how to get the uniform to the colonel's cell? The key lies with thy admirer, Wilfred Shabby. I think. Mind, I say, I think. I can get anything I want from Wilfred. And I think. Mind, I say, I think. You can leave that to me. Then get ye hence, my lad, and bless thee for thy sacrifice. And take my blessing too, dear Leonard. And thy, eh? <laughs> thy love is newborn. Wrap it up carefully, lest it catch cold and die. <laughs> Alas, I wait for two and throw dark danger hangs upon the deed. Dark danger hangs upon the deed. The scheme is rash and well may fail, but ours are not the heart that will. Hands that shrink, the cheeks that pale, the arms of me. No, ours are not the hearts that will. I breathe to him my 
I owe my life, it's his, I count it not. That life is his, so count it not. Then shall I break the risk to run when services him be done to save the life of such an one? Unworthy thought, unworthy thought. Then shall we break the risk? Cheer. We may save him yet. But see, Father, they bring the poor man from the fall shop. Is his hour not yet come? No, no. They take him to the cold hour to oh, await his solitude. But softly, the lieutenant shouldn't hear thee cry. Oh, Colonel Fairfax, it is a sad day indeed. Sir, I greet it with all goodwill. And I thank you for the zealous care with which you have guarded me from the pestilent dangers which threaten human life outside. In this happy little community, death, when it comes, doth so in punctual and businesslike fashion. And like a courtly gentleman, he doth do notice of his advent, that one may not be taken unawares. Sir, you bear this bravely as a brave man should. <laughs> Sir. It is no light boon to die swiftly and surely at a given time and in a given fashion. <laughs> Truth to tell, I would have my life, but if that may not be, I have the next best thing to it, which is death. <laughs> Believe me, sir, my lot is not so much amiss. Father, father, I can't bear it. Oh, my poor lass. Nay, hey, pretty one. Why weepest thou? Come, be comforted. Such a life as mine is not worth weeping for. Sergeant Merrill, is it not? <laughs> May I greet my old friend? <laughs> Why, man, what's all this? Thou and I have faced the grim old king a dozen times, and never has his majesty come to me in such goodly fashion. Keep a stout heart, good fellow. We are soldiers, thou and I, and we know how to die. It is easier to die well than to live well, for in sooth I have tried both. <laughs> Life a thorn, then count 
counted not a whit. They counted not a whit. Man is well done. I might have had to live another morn. I might have had to live to live another. Experiment in the art of merriment into his big 
there's humor in all things, and the truest philosophy is that which teaches us to find it and make the most of it. The hands off, I say, a mannerly fellow! Did I hear her say hands off? Aye, I heard her say it, and I felt you do it. What then? Well, that's not the humor of it. Nay, if I do hang. That's not. Now, observe. She said hands off. Whose hands? Thine. Off whom? Off her. Why? Because she is a woman. And had she not been a woman, thine hands had not been laid upon her at all. And so the reason for the laying on of the hands is the reason for the laying off of the hands. And herein is contradiction contradicted. It is the very marriage of the pro with the con. And no such lopsided union either as times go. For pro is not more unlike con than man is unlike woman. And yet men and women marry every day with none to say, oh, the pity of it, but odd and fools like me. <laughs> <laughs> now, wherefore shall we please you? We can rhyme you couplets, triolet, hot train, sonnet, rondelay, ballad, which you will more. We can dance you pimpernel, carole, jumping joan. <gasps> Let us give them the singing force of the merry man and his maid. There in his song and dance, too. Oh. Aye. 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 Aye.
father. Uh, sir, we sang to these folk, and they would have repaid us with gross courtesy, but for your honor's comings. Away with ye. Clear the rabble. Go, go, get on, go, shoot, get, just go, a go, get, just on the end. Now you, girl, who are you and uh, what are you doing here? May it please you, sir. We are two strolling players, Jacqueline Point. And I, Elsie Maynard, at your worship's service. We go from fair to fair, singing and dancing and playing brief interludes, and so we make a poor living. You are married? Oh, no, no, no. For though I am a fool, there's a limit to my folly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Old Bridget Maynard, Elsie's mother, travels with us, for Elsie is a good girl, but her, she is a bed with fever, and so as we've come here to buy silver to buy an electory for her. Hark ye, girl. Your mother is ill. Sorely ill, sir. Oh, 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 and she requires good food and many other things that thou canst not buy for her. Alas, sir, it is too true. Wouldst thou make a hundred crowns? A hundred They might save her life. Then listen, a worthy but unhappy gentleman is to be beheaded in one hour on this very spot. For sufficient reasons, he wishes to be married before he dies, and he hath asked me to find him a wife. Wilt thou be that wife? Uh, the wife of a man I have never seen? Oh, hark you, sir. I'm involved in this, for though Elsie and I are not yet married, time works wonders, and there's no telling what might be in store for us. <laughs> well, okay, have we your worship's word that this gentleman is to die today. Oh, nothing is more certain, I grieve to say. And that the maiden will be allowed to depart the very instant that the ceremony is at an end. Oh, the very instant I pledge my honor that it shall be so. An hundred crowns. An hundred crowns. Well, for my part, I consent, but it's for Elsie to speak. <laughs> How say you, maiden, will you wed a man to lose his head? For half an hour you'll be a wife, and then the town is yours for life. A headless wife wife refuse, if true love will itself, most bright rooms ever.
sir. And like some of my jests, out of place. <laughs> well, Jack-o'-lantern, this is just wonderful. It just so happens I have a vacancy for such a one. Tell me, what are your qualifications for such a post? Oh, Mary, sir, I have My name's not Mary, but go on. <laughs> I can rhyme you extempore. I can convulse you with quip and conundrum. I have the lighter philosophies at my tongue's tip. I can be merry, wise, quaint, grim, and sardonic. One by one, or all at once. I know all the jests, ancient and modern, past, present, and to come. I can riddle you from dawn of day to set of sun, and if that content you not, well unto midnight and the small hours. Oh, oh sir, a pretty wit, I warrant you, a pretty, pretty wit. And drive and junk, and cook and plank, for lowly folk, and men of rank. I climb a craft, and to no fear, but aim my shaft at prince or peer. You see, I have daughters. Sir, my jests are most carefully selected, and anything objectionable is expunged. If your honor wishes, I can try them first on your honor's chaplet. Can you give me an example? Let us say, for instance, that I had, um, oh, that I had sat me down hurriedly on something sharp. Oh! <laughs> The joint of meat is but half cooked. Mm I should say that what is underdone cannot be helped. I 
I see. <laughs> I should imagine that that manner of thing would get somewhat irritating. Perhaps at first, sir, but use is everything, and you would come in time to like it. Okay, one more, because the song was cute. Um, <laughs> consider that I had caught you kissing the kitchen wench under my very nose. Under her nose? That's her I would kiss her, sir, not under yours. <laughs>
with a strange singing girl. I would fain have espied them, but they stopped up the keyhole. My keyhole. Wilfred, and a mug. Now, what could he have wanted with her? That's what puzzles me. Now to get the keys from him. None. Thy adored Fairfax is to die. Oh, nay, thou knowest I have naught but pity for the poor condemned gentleman. I know that he who is about to die is worth more to thee than I, who am alive and <coughs> well. Oh, no, when that were out of dear of reason, dear Wilfred, do they not say that a blithe ass is better than a dead lion? <laughs> Say that, do they? It is unpardonably rude of them, but I do believe they put it that way. <laughs> Not that it applies to me, who art clever beyond all telling. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> as an assistant tormentor. Nay, as a wit, as a humorist, <laughs> and as a most philosophic commentator on the vanity of human resolution. Truly, uh, I, I've seen great resolution give way under my, my persuasive methods in the nice regulation of a thumbscrew. In the hundredth part of the single revolution lies all the difference between a stony silence and a torrent of impulsive, unresolving that a pen can scarcely follow. Uh, I am a man of uh, Chamber are the prettiest hearing. I am a pleasant fellow, and I choose. I'm the merriest dog that barks. Uh, so we, we could be passing happy together. Perhaps. I do not know. Or thou wouldst make a most tender and loving wife. I, to one whom I truly loved, for there is a wealth of love within this little heart, saving up for I wonder whom. Now, of all the men in the world, I wonder whom. To think that he whom I am to marry is alive and somewhere, perhaps, far away, perhaps, close at hand, and I know him not. It seemeth as if I am simply wasting time in not knowing him. Now, now, now say that to desire. Nay, nay, suppose it for the nonce that we are wed. Suppose it only that, that thou art my wife and thy cheery, joysome, bright, frolicsome husband, and that for the day's work being done and all the prisoners shut away for the night, that you and I are alone together with a, with a long, long evening before us. Yeah. <laughs> it is a pretty picture, but I scarcely know it cometh so unexpectedly, and yet were I thy bride. I wert thou my bride. Oh, how I would love thee. <laughs> Were not too wide to hold my wealth of love. Were I thy bride, upon 
I should be no mean judge of wooing for driving more wooed, partly wooed than most men. I have been wooed by, by maid, by widow, and by wife. I have been wooed boldly, timidly, shyly, tearfully, by direct assault, by inference, by implication, and by innuendo. <laughs> but this wooing is not of the common order. It's the wooing of one who must needs woo me if she died for it. The deed is so far safely accomplished. The sly boots. How she wheedled him. Ha! What a ninny is a lovesick man. He is but a lute in a woman's hand. She plays upon him however she will. But the colonel comes, and faith, he's just in time for the yeoman come to parade his execution in two minutes. My good and kind friend, thou bearest a grave risk for me. Tut, sir, no risk. A warrant shall be well welcomed here. You do make a brave yeoman, sir, but so your ruffle is too high, and oh my goodness. Use your halberd, sir, carry thus. Now remember, you are my brave son, Leonard Mantle. If I might not bear mine own name, there is no other name I would bear so readily. Now, sir, put a brave face on it, for the yeoman come. <laughs>
take and depart from all escape, face with gallant heart and shaken, dead in most appalling shape. Let the barrel, let the barrel, dead in most appalling shape. Truly, I was to be pitied, having but an hour to live. I reluctantly submitted, I had no Oh, my God. 
devil's bridge is open where no prisoner is. We hunted high, we hunted near, but then we sunk with anxious grim with banishment to empty air. The madness of with anxious grim with banishment to empty air.
calling would suit me to a hair. Yeah. 
computer screen, he's at you again, for he likes to get value for money. He'll ask then and there, with an insolent stare, if you know that you're paid to be funny. Oh, and add to the task of a many man's place, and he'll fix the ass with a scowl on his face. If you know that you're paid to be funny, comes a bishop, maybe you're a sort of lady, you'll be better for the egg of provoking. Better not to hit a hammer, just pins in his chair, he don't understand the next thing he's looking. It's the death of two crack, I'm going to knock smack, and again, it's like a smile from the same. But should they, by chance, be imported from France? Have a crown is knocked out of your wages. It's a general rule, though you feel it in French, and the family of you will be told it's too French. Have a crown is knocked out of your wages. Though your head it may rack with the bees, attacking your senses with too late or losing. Don't be mopey and flat, they don't find you for that, if you're properly quaint and amusing.
two days gone and no news of poor Fairfax. The dolts, they seek him everywhere, save within a dozen yards of his dungeon. So, I'm free. Free, save for the cursed haste with which I plunge myself headlong into the bonds of matrimony with heaven knows who. From what I remember, she should have been young. But even then, had not her face been covered by her kerchief, I doubt whether in my thin blood I should have paid much note of her. Free! Bah. The tower bonds were but a thread of silk compared with these conjugal fetters, which I, <laughs> fool that I was, placed upon my own hands. From the one I broke readily enough, how to break from the other. Enough, sir. She's quite strong again and leaves us tonight. Thanks to Dame Carruthers, kind nursing, eh? <laughs> oh, deuce take the old witch! Heart was but a sorry trick you played on me, sir, to send me the fainting girl. It gave the old woman an excuse to take up quarters in my home, and for the past two years I have shunned her like the plague. Another day more of it, and she would have married me. Oh, good lord, here she comes again. I'll let him go. Nay, hey, Sergeant Merrill, don't go. I have something of grave import to say to thee. It's coming. In truth, I, I think I'm not wanted here. Oh, nay, Master Leonard, I have not to say to thy father that his son may not hear. True. <laughs> I am one of the family. I have forgot. <laughs> Tis about this Elsie Maynard, a pretty girl, Master Leonard. I. There's a peach blossom. What then? She hath a liking for thee, or I mistake not. With all my heart, she's as dainty little maid as you 
find in the Midsummer Day's March. Then be warned in time and give not thy heart to her. Oh, I know there is to give my heart to one who will have none of it. Aye, she knows all about it. And, and, and why should my boy take heed of her? She's a good girl, Dame Carruthers. Good enough for aught I know, but she's no girl. She's a married woman. A married woman? Tush, old lady. She's engaged to the lieutenant's new jester, Jack Point. Push in thy teeth, old man. As my niece Kate sat by her bedside, she moaned and groaned and turned this way and that. And how should I marry one I've never seen? Quoth she. And a hundred crowns. Quoth she. And it's a sad he will die within the hour. Quoth she. And I love him not, and yet I am his wife. Quoth she. Is it not so, Kate? I am. Tis even so. <laughs> but art thou sure of all this? Aye, sir, for I have wrote it all down in my tablet. Now mark my words. It was of this fair fact she spake. He is her, he is her husband, or I'll swallow my kernel. Is it true, sir? <laughs> true. <laughs> the girl's raving. <laughs> Why should she marry a man whom she had never met before? Marry? There be those that would marry but for an hour, rather than die an old maid. Aye. fortune's lucky bag. In truth, I might have fared worse with my eyes open. <laughs> but she comes, now to test her principles. Tis not
not every husband who gets a chance of wooing his own wife. <laughs> Mr. Kelsey, Master Leonard! So thou leavest us tonight. Yes, Master Leonard. I have been kindly tended, and I almost fear I am loath to go. And Miss Fairfax, was so glad when he escaped. Why, truly, Master Leonard, it is a sad thing that a young and gallant gentleman should die in the very fullness of his life. So, when thou didst faint in my arms, it was for joy and safety. It may be so. I was highly wrought, Master Leonard, and I am but a girl. And so, when I am highly wrought, I faint. <laughs> now dost thou know that I am consumed with a parlous jealousy. Thou? And of whom? Why, of this Fairfax, surely. Colonel Fairfax? Aye. Elsie, shall I be straight with thee? Elsie, I love thee ardently, passionately. Elsie, I have loved thee these two days, which is a long time. <laughs> and I would fain join thy life to mine. <laughs> Master Leonard, thou art jesting. Jesting? May I shrivel into raisins if I jest. Elsie, I love thee with a love that is a fever, with a love that is a frenzy, with a love that eateth up my heart. What sayest thou? Will thou not allow my heart to be eaten up? <laughs> oh, mercy. What am I to say? Dost thou love me, or hast thou been insensible these two days? I love all brave men. <clears throat> Nay. There is love in excess. I thank heaven there are many brave men in England, but if thou lovest them all, then I withdraw my thanks. I love the bravest best. But, sir, I may not listen. I, I'm not free. I, I'm a wife. Thou a wife? Whose? His hours are numbered. Nay, his grave is dug and his epitaph set up. Come, his name. Oh, sir, keep my secret. It is the only barrier that fate can set up between us. My husband is none other than Colonel Fairfax. Oh, stop, stop so late at 
not to be done with time worm jest and threadbare sophistries, with quips, conundrums, rhymes, and paradoxes. It is an art itself and must be studied gravely and conscientiously. <laughs> Like a little squirrel in a nest. 
is a pretty picture. A maggot in a nut lies closer, but a squirrel will do. Who knowest that thou wast a wife, an unloved and unloving wife, when his poor heart was near to breaking? But now that thine unloving husband is dead, and thou art free, he would fain pray that you would hearken unto him, and give him hope that you would one day be his. He presses your hands and whispers in her ear? Pots bodikins, what does it mean? Now, tell me, sweetheart, wilt thou be this poor, good fellow's wife? If the good, brave, is he a brave man? So men say. Well, that's not true, but we'll let that pass. If the brave man be content with a poor, penniless, untaught maid. Widow, but we'll let that pass. <laughs> I will be his true and loving wife, and not with my heart of hearts. My own dear love. <laughs> brother, uh, my brother. Stop that, it is not seemly. Uh, hold, Master Lennon, and uh, an advocate should have his fee, but methinks thou art overpaying thyself. Nay, that is for Elsie to say. I promise thee that I will teach thee how to woo. And herein lies the proof of the virtue of my teaching. Go thou now and apply elsewhere. <laughs>
plan to escape. And I pretended to be his dearly loving sister and did everything I could to make the folk believe I was his dearly loving sister. And this is how he repays me. The next time I pretend to be sister to anyone again, I'll turn nun and be sister to everyone. <laughs> One as much as another. Thee. <laughs> Come, I am thy Phoebe, 
water through my folly. Wilfred here discovered our little secret. And the price of his silence is... Phoebe's heart. <laughs> oh, dear. No, 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 no. Phoebe's hand. <laughs> it's the same thing. But the colonel had to be saved at any cost, and as thy folly revealed our secret, so must thy folly even suffer for it. <laughs> Dear Carruthers! So this is a plot to shield this archfiend, and I have detected it. A word from me, and three heads alongside his would roll from their shoulders. No, 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 Colonel Fairfax is reprieved. If my complicity in his escape were to be known, well, oh, plague on you, meddler. There's nothing to be done for it. <coughs> Hush, pretty one! <laughs> Such bloodthirsty words bitter those days. Cherry lips. Oh, Sergeant oh. Merrill. <laughs> Why, why look ye, Chuck? <laughs> For many a month I've, I've, I've thought to myself that, that that's not love saving up in that middle-aged bosom. <laughs> For someone, and, and why not for thee, that, that's me, take heart and tell her that that's thee, that thou, me, lovest her, thee, and, and, and. And I'm a miserable old man, and I've done it. And, and that's me. What's not a word about care? Price for thy silence is Meryl's heart. No, 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 no. no. Uh, Meryl's hand. Oh, it's the same thing. <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> Satanity, God, and glimity down, declivity, sins, captivity, down for them. God, and glimity down, declivity, fix, captivity, down for them. Joyful, joyful, when virginity sweeps so joyful, man's affinity, fate of flowery, bright and flowery, gives her dowry, joyful, joyful, fate of flowery, bright and flowery, gives her dowry, joyful, joyful. Ghastly, ghastly, when man's awful, firstly, lastly, not to mournful, when what's ten. Thank <laughs> you. 
Sentimental shock. My heart's 